It is good to see everybody this morning, and we do have a large crowd here. We're so thankful for that. We have a lot of goings on today with our senior celebration, and uh, then later on this week on Saturday, our youth day. Uh, Evan always does such a good job with that and leading that, and then of course, a week from today, the Memphis School of Preaching Lectureship begins, and boy, how we need that. And how excited we are to uh, see people come in from different places and uh, spend time with people that we love. And we're looking forward to, of course, uh, great gospel preaching. That is the main reason we're gathering together. As we continue to see ways that we can draw nearer to God this year, we started, of course, with worship the first quarter, and now we are into prayer. How can prayer help us draw closer to God? We're going to uh, ask and answer a question today that is often, I think, misunderstood. Hopefully this will bring some clarity to it and not cause more confusion. And let me encourage you, since we have some of you visiting with us today, I'm glad that you're here today, especially for this. We're going to, starting in two weeks, uh, come up with some very practical ways to help our own personal prayer life. Uh, things that will, in a very practical way, help us draw closer to God. And perhaps in ways that you've never seen before. For every Christian, I think it's going to be especially helpful. So let me encourage you to come back for these series of lessons. But let, today, let's talk about praying in accordance with God's will. That the Bible is plain when telling believers the promises of, is, uh, of prayer to believers is plain. We see this in various texts, these promises that we see in prayer. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. You see the promise. It's no doubt that the Bible tells us God hears our prayers and he answers our prayers. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. That's plain, isn't it? 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything, and now here's a phrase, according to his will, he hears us, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So these passages are very plain, but sadly, in response to these verses and others like them, a line of thought has developed within even Christians that causes people to miss the power of these promises. It goes something like this. If I have strong enough faith, or if I'm good enough, then God will give me exactly what I want. Why didn't he give me what I want? Well, I must not have had strong enough faith, or I must not have been good enough this week because he didn't give me what I want. And they, this, this thought develops from passages like this and a misunderstanding of them. That's not what these passages teach. What is misunderstood is the context of these promises. God's giving you what you ask for is not dependent upon only what type of faith that you have or even the amount of faith that you have. But here it is. Is your faith in alignment with God's will? There is the question. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Jesus taught us exactly how to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. This model prayer combined with the promises of prayer is inviting us into an exciting way to pray to God and expect answers from him in accordance with his will. Uh, several years ago, a man by the name of Anthony Rex, a brother by the name of Anthony Rex, wrote a, a good article in the Gospel Advocate, and he gave two points uh, that I'm going to use today 
uh, for this lesson, and then we'll elaborate even more than what he brought out in the article. But two barriers, and these are his two points I'm talking about. He talked about two barriers that stand in our way when it comes to praying the will of God. Two barriers, and here they are. Number one, knowing God's will. That's a barrier. If I'm going to pray for the will of God to be done in my life, then what do I need to know? I need to understand what the will of God is. And then the second barrier is wanting God's will. Knowing God's will and wanting or desiring God's will. Those are two big barriers that keep a lot of prayers from being answered by God in the way that we would like them to. Knowing God's will, desiring God's will. Knowing God's will begins with knowing what God has revealed to us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 tells us that Scripture is the revealed mind of God. All Scripture, as we know, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Every good work. We understand that Scripture is the revealed mind of God. What should I do? What's the Bible say? How should I think? What's the Bible say? What should I pray for? For what should I pray? What does the Bible say? It is the revealed mind of God for our lives. And within these pages of Scriptures, we have before us not only God's mind, but His intentions his plans, and His will. Scripture is the revealed will of God. And so the first barrier that we have to work through is to know God's will, and to know God's will, what must I know? The Word of God. The Word of God. And so to pray in accordance with God's will is to pray in response to Scripture. So think about this. Because I'm learning God's will, I'm understanding God's will, I'm applying God's will, then what's going to happen to my prayer life? It's going to respond to understanding and knowing the will of God. If we're still praying the same way that we did when we were three years old, then there's a problem. Not that their prayers aren't pure and beautiful, because they are. But if I'm still praying in that same way, then there's a problem. I haven't matured. I don't know the will of God. I haven't studied the Scripture. And so if Scripture is not guiding our prayer lives, then there's a good chance we are misguided in our prayers. When Scripture does not inform us and guide our prayer lives, then what are we left to do? We are left to inform and guide ourselves. I've used illustrations like this before, but I love to hear children pray because they pray what they think. And the things that they pray for are sometimes comical, but they're sincere as they pray it. But this is the type of immaturity. I pray that mom gives us pizza tonight instead of liver. That was a common prayer of mine <laughs> when I was a child. I grew up in the days that where parents thought if you didn't eat liver once a week, then you were a horrible parent. How come I couldn't have grown up a couple decades later? I don't know. But anyway, I digress a little bit. But those are the types of prayers that they offer. In other words, they're just telling God, this is what I want. I want pizza tonight instead of liver. I want it to snow tonight so I don't have to go to school tomorrow. God, I'm just telling you what I want from you. And you stay there and you answer my prayers. Sometimes, Christians who should know better still pray that same type of prayer, not for pizza over liver or not for snow so we don't have to go to school. But God, I want to inform you what I want in my life. 
And so a barrier that we have to overcome is to know the scriptures so the scriptures can guide our prayer life and our prayer life can be a response to what God's will is. We might be praying to a God of our own imagination and formation, a God who acts the way we think he should act, works how we think he should work. And isn't that all where false idols and idolatry come in? Why do I want this God? Why do I want this idol? Well, because I want this one to give me what I want in this area. And the Hindus themselves claim to have over a, a million gods, a million different gods. They have their main gods, and then they have sub-gods under that, and they continue to add gods almost on a daily basis. And, I, and I'm not saying this to be facetious. I'm saying this, this is true. How do these gods keep developing? Well, I've got a need in my life, therefore, we need a god for that. We need a God for this. Something is amiss in my life. I need a God for this. And so continually, they continually add gods to their religion. Why? So that I'll have a God for every facet of my life. And the problem is the God of heaven is the God that can supply all those needs And when our will lines up to his will, then all of those things that I think are missing in my life, I soon discover I didn't need them anyway. When we do this, the true God is limited and ignored and we end up disappointed and frustrated because our prayers are not a response to what the Scripture tells us. But here's the question, and maybe this is what you are already thinking, and if you are, I hope uh, that, that you're going to find the answer in this. What about those things? Okay, so what you're saying, Mark, is for me to know what to pray, then I need to know God's will, because God's will will tell me the direction I need to take in my life. But what about, what about the things Scripture does not reveal? Where should I live? Who should I marry? Should I take this job or that job? Should I paint the living room white or should I paint it blue? What about those types of things that the Scripture does not reveal? What do I do then? Turn with me to our text for today, James chapter 4. James chapter 4. And in this, as you're turning there, what about the things like people's health improving or plans that I'm making for the future? How can I know God's will and then pray in accordance with his will for those things? For those things that I do not know that are not revealed in Scripture. In other words, we are praying, of course, for people on our prayer list. And what is our prayer? We pray that they get better, right? How do we know of those things that are not revealed to us in Scripture that we're praying correctly? What about these gray areas we might even call them? Where should I live? Who should I marry? Should I take this job or that job? What do I do in those areas? Well, James chapter 4, starting with verse 13, gives us some insight to this. And we know this text well. We know parts of this text well. And then we know other parts very well. But let me make a suggestion to you. Very rarely do we connect these two parts. And because we do not connect them very often, we miss the power of the overall context of this. Look at James chapter 4. We know this one. We know this passage well. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. We know that part very well, don't we? Those who say, well, I'm going to go into such and such a city, continue there a year, buy, sell, get gain, make a lot of money. 
And then we know the next part. Your life is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Don't we know that part very, very well? Instead, we ought to say, if the Lord wills. We know that part. But have you ever seen the context of verse 17? We know this verse. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You see, we know that verse very well. We know the vapor part very well. But do we ever put those together and realize that verse 17 is in the context of asking the Lord's will to be done? God is calling us to have humility with things that we're not told explicitly. Should I go to this city? Should I stay there a year? Should I buy and sell and get gain? Not a thing wrong with any of those things. What was the problem? The problem was, I'm going to tell God what I'm going to do. I've got my life all planned out. And God is not anywhere in the picture. For this you ought to say, if it is your will, I'm going to go to this city. I'm going to stay there a year. I'm going to buy and uh, sell. And if it is your will, I'm going to make a profit in so doing. If it is your will, I'm going to do this. Rather than telling God, this is what I'm going to do. God, this is, if it is your will, this is what I plan on doing. Are you in this or not? He wants us to have an attitude of openness and a willingness to allow God to lead our lives. If it is not your will, God, then I don't want any part of it. And then verse 17 Here's the key to unlock praying in accordance with God's will, I believe. In accordance with God's will and the things he has not revealed. Watch verse 17. So this is all in that context. Going to such a city, ten year, there a year, buy, sell, get, gain. You don't know that's going to happen. You don't know if you even have tomorrow. Your life is a vapor that appears for a little time then vanishes away. What you ought to say, if the Lord wills, I will do this or that. And then verse 17, verse 16, you're boasting and you're arrogance. This boasting is, is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. The key is doing what you know to do. Doing right that you know to do. What is right? That should be the first question we ask when making any future plans. Graduates, are you listening? What is right? What does God want me to do with the rest of my life? Do you think that God... And I want to be careful here, but I want you to think about what I'm saying. We're all talented in different ways. Do you think that God really cares whether or not you're a lawyer or a doctor or if you're our factory worker or whatever else you want to put in there as long as it's a good, honest work? Do you think God really cares what you are? Or does he care, number one, that you're faithful to him? And then you use your talents in the way God has blessed you. What should be number one? Those who know to do right. So when you're making this decision, who should I marry? We over here, we have woman A. She was raised in the church. She's a faithful Christian. She lives a righteous, righteous godly life. And then over here is B. The opposite of this woman is this woman. God, what is your will? What should I do? Who should I marry? We already know the answer, don't we? Here's this job. I could become a nurse or I could become a bartender. God, just give me a sign. What should I do? The answer's already given, isn't it? To him that knows to do good and does not do it, what is it? It's sin. Listen to this statement. If we excel in what is revealed, 
We will be led in what is not revealed. And what I mean by that is this. You know, God never told me all those years ago, you're going to marry a girl by the name of Mindy. She's going to have dark hair. She's going to have brown eyes. She's going to be from Selma, Indiana. He didn't speak to me in that. But he does speak to Christians about the type of person we ought to try, seek to seek and find to marry. You see? You see what I'm saying? You see what the Bible's saying? And so in those things that God has not spelled out for us, what do I do? We excel in what is revealed and we trust God. When we do right, that he'll take care of us. God has told us plenty of things to do, and if we excel in those, we will be sure to be aligned with God on what is not revealed. But here's the question, and our last and final point. Do I really want his, to do his will? Knowing God's will is one thing, but the bigger question is, do I really want to do his will? That's where the proverbial rubber meets the road, doesn't it? You ever know people? Maybe even know yourself at certain points in your life when you know good and well what the Bible says. But you also know good and well you're not doing it. What was going on during that time? I knew the will of God, but I just didn't want to do it. One of the major impacts of sin is the hostility we have towards God's supremacy. Romans chapter 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. The secret deception of sin is that life without God will be better than life with Him. That's what we're thinking when we know God's will, but we don't want to do His will. Satan is winning the battle in your life at that time when I can convince myself That a life apart from God's will is better than a life aligned with God's will. However, the more the person learns the revealed will of God, the more he will want his will for his life. And this happens because God's will is for your highest good. We had some fun on Wednesday night, and I was asking about, you know, if you could have one flaw in your life, to have it removed from your life, what would it be? And we discussed some things, and we asked about age. Would you want to go back to what you were when you were in your 20s strong. And somebody made a comment afterwards. We had a good discussion. I wouldn't give up age if I had to give up the wisdom that came with it. And isn't that true? And young people... I remember being your age. I remember thinking just the way that you think. And I remember preachers making statements like this that I didn't take to heart. But all of us who are older, and even those older than me, will understand what I'm getting ready to say. The things when I was young that I thought would bring great pleasure, that were apart from God's will, I wish I could go back and make 
the opposite decision of all the times I went against God's will. Don't you? And I wish I would have learned from the first time I knew that I knew anything that God's will and following his will and aligning, aligning my will up to his is really what brings true joy in life. It really, really, really is. And I'm not going to stand up here and say, I always make the right decision now because I'm older. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's a battle we all still fight today. But I understand something, and we know this to be true. That God's will is what makes us the happiest in life. The things that truly, 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 truly matter in the world. And it sounds so fun. Let me just use an example. When we were young, to chase all the girls that you want, sow your wild, wild oats, and you think, that's where the joy is. But then, you find that one woman that goes through the heights of happiness with you and the depths of the valleys of the low with you and you realize, okay, that's what you can only get when you follow God's plan to find one woman and spend the rest of your life with her. You see, you would never know that joy apart from following God's will. And we can say that with every single instance and every single example. What I'm trying to say is God's will is what brings fulfillment. It's what brings joy. It's what brings lasting happiness. His will from the very beginning was to save us from our sin Redeem us for our highest purpose and grant us the riches of his inheritance. Ephesians chapter 3, verses, Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. And then the last, the more you learn his revealed will, the more you'll learn to trust his will is for you. And listen, I invite you, yea, God invites you to test him on these things. You test him on these things. You follow his will. And watch where it will lead you. Now don't give up after a day or two. But you follow his will and you watch the blessings that will come to you. I'm not talking about get rich quick schemes. Oh, if I do his will, then I'm going to have a million dollars by next year. No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. You watch and you Put to the test the lasting value of worldly things versus godly things. And you see what truly makes you fulfilled in life. Knowing God's will and wanting God's will will fuel each other to shape our prayer life. Our prayer life, when I know God's will, I know because I've studied his word, this is what God's will is for me and my life and now I've come to the conclusion, God, I surrender. I want my will to be your will. And you watch when those two things come together. Watch your prayer life grow. When that moment in your life comes, you remind yourself that God's will is for your highest good. And you choose his will over your own. And then I bolded this because I want you to be left with this. The will of God is exactly what you would always want if you knew everything from God's viewpoint. The will of God is exactly what you would want, would always want if you knew everything from God's viewpoint. He knows what's best. And if I could just see it from his viewpoint. I would have no problem trusting. Because I know. 
If it's God's will for me, then I know it's the best for me. And so I want to do his will. Isn't this what guided the prayer life of Jesus? He said to himself, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6, verse 38. And this belief faced some serious challenges from the wilderness to the temptations to the cross. In the garden he prayed, let this cup pass from me, I pray. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Luke twenty two forty two. 42. It meant that accepting God's will would mean torture and death. And you might say, well, how in the world could that have been good for Jesus? Where is he now? He got up from the dead. He's at the right hand of God. And he reigns. God knew what he was doing even then. And thank God he did. did. For God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, what did he do? Christ died for us. These two things, these two barriers, if we can overcome them, know God's will, study, study, not just casually glance, study, seek God's will for you in his word. Look for it. Study the word of God. And then that second barrier, now that I know God's will, it's time to start working on my life. And that'll start at day one in Bible study. I promise you, doesn't it? Here's what God wants. Now, Mark, you know what you need to do. And until those two things line up, your prayer life is going to be frustrating. It's going to be sporadic. It's going to be problematic. But when they do, watch out. Are you a child of God today? You know his will for you is to obey. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ? Will you be baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 27, so that your sins will be washed away, Acts 22, 16? Or at one time you did obey the gospel, but you've not been living as you should. Will you come home? Let us pray. Let us pray for you. That's God's will. Will your will desire to line up with him? Won't you come all together we stand and sing?